ladies and oops, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming along this afternoon and for joining Paul's family and myself in celebrating his life. Um, in three days' time, Paul would have been 99. So I think it's very appropriate that we gather here today and share memories of him. I have to thank uh, all the many friends, of, all Paul's many friends who have come here and offered to give us a contribution. And we look forward to hearing from them. So uh, without any further ado, can I ask the first speaker to come along and address us? Thank you, Ian. Lara, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Around the time that I was working on my 1974 National Library exhibition to commemorate the tercentenary of the birth of Alan Ramsey, the poet, and the bicentenary of the death of his son, Alan, the portrait painter, Paul Scott and his fellow editor came to see me about a proposed book. This was not just any book. It would see the light as the invaluable compilation, A Scottish Postbag, Eight Centuries of Scottish Letters. And the other editor was no ordinary literary man. It was George Bruce. To assist them, I formed a working party of National Library manuscript curators to make suggestions for items that might be included in the book. What a superbly rich anthology it is. How excellently edited, both in selection of material and in judicious commentary. Although I greatly liked George Bruce and his work, it was Paul who struck me in so many ways as the more remarkable character. Here was a man who, in peace and war, at home and abroad, in the ancient kingdom and firth of the realm, had done so much. That first meeting paved the way to many years of contact and mutual enjoyment of many aspects of Scottish cultural life. I say this happily while confessing that Paul's politics and mine were widely divergent on the matter of unionism. Too often I felt that I could only mutter to him sotto voce that I did not quite share his forceful nationalism. I thought of him as W. E. Aiton described the Scottish royal banner, the ruddy lion ramping in the field of treasure gold. But that did not stop me liking and admiring Paul enormously. We began to consider the future of his voluminous papers. He had retained a vast quantity of files preserving the record of his involvement in every aspect of Scottish life. What was to be done with this mass of material? It seemed that the floors and joists of Joshua Gardens were in real danger of giving way. Could the National Library become the repository of the papers of Paul Henderson Scott, CMG? Well, it so happened that I was in a position to offer sanctuary to the Scott Archive and to take it in little by little as Paul went through it all and made it ready for transfer, section by section, theme by theme, cause by cause, one period of life and what had filled those busy days after another. We discussed his papers over many convivial meetings in the Scottish Arts Club, here in the new club, and at his flat. But I wanted to make sure that Paul alienated nothing before he had filleted the files for another purpose. As I got to know him better, and I'd learned just how much he had done in his student, military, administrative, diplomatic, political, scholarly, and literary lives, so I'd become convinced that he should write it all down, that the self-biography he surely had locked within him should take form, based upon those papers. When, in 2002, a 20th century life duly appeared, Paul was kind enough to acknowledge me as catalyst in this endeavour, I remain very proud to have been the sand in his oyster. The smooth, glistening pearl always looks better than the ripe, gritty grain of sand. Paul's was a teeming life that a younger man could only learn about and read of with admiration verging on astonishment. Paul's many books, not least his two autobiographical volumes, will ensure that his life and work is long remembered and that his name will endure. Few Scots of his generation were so broadly engaged with their times, or so widely influential. From this club, we look out at the statue of Alan Ramsey, the poet, to whom I alluded a moment ago. Ramsey shrewdly sensed the transience and impermanence of a literary reputation. 
the productions of one day might be discarded and dishonoured the next. Remember that around 1740, James Boswell's intimate letters to William Temple were discovered actually being used as wrapping paper in Boulogne. Paul might have shared my whimsical amusement at one particular poem of Honest Allen, with which I close my contribution. Like Horace, in the 20th epistle of his first book, but actually out Horacing Horace in wit and colour, Ramsey sent his verse into the world with a cautionary blessing and a cynical understanding of the inevitability of things. Dear adventurous book, e'en tack thy will, and scope around the world thy fill. Wow, ye are newfangled to be seen in gilded turkey clad and clean. Daft giddy thing, to draw thy fate, and spang our dykes that scar the blate. I dinna doubt, whilst thou art new, you'll favour find, frae not a few. But when thou ruffled and forfern, sair thumbed by ilka coof or bairn, then, then by age ye may grow wise, and ken things common gain a price. At fret weighs me to see thee lie beneath the bottom of a pie, or cowed out page by page to wrap up snuff or sweeties in a shop. <laughs> I have an exhibit, and I wonder how many people here remember this, and I'm sorry if you can't go see it. It's the poster produced by Scottish Writers Against the Bomb in the mid-1980s. The poster lists an impressive array of writers of the time, among them, of course, Paul Scott. Paul was a leading light of the group. I think he must have been elected chair at some point. And somewhere in the depths of my loft, I may have paperwork with dates uh, and details, um, but I'm afraid I haven't conducted a search. Maybe someone here has a, has a clearer memory. At any rate, it was through Scottish Writers Against the Bomb, SWAB, as it was familiarly known, that I first met Paul and realized very quickly that here was not just a man of conviction, but a man of conviction who got things done. This was confirmed in spades when later I got to know him better. When I joined the committee of Scottish Pen, Paul was president, and not just president, but a president who was determined that Scottish Pen the Scottish Centre of Penn International should host the annual International Congress in Edinburgh. This was a huge and ambitious undertaking. Edinburgh had hosted the Penn International Congress twice before, but the last time was in 1950. And now, in the mid-90s, Penn was set to become a larger and more influential organisation whose work protecting writers and freedom of expression was more important than ever. Paul masterminded the whole thing. Certainly, he had a dedicated band of volunteers to assist, not least Laura, whose role in pen over many years has been heroic. But in my experience, volunteers can't operate successfully unless they are led by energy and conviction. Paul supplied both. The Congress of 1997 brought to Scotland writers from all over the world and was a milestone both in Scottish Pen's development and in helping to put Scottish writing on an international map. It was a week of inspiring events and challenging conversation which set Scottish Pen on a course of development and increasing influence. As an organization, it is deeply indebted to Paul's leadership. From the time of his return to Scotland in 1980, Paul applied himself to the task 
of making people more aware of Scotland's history and literature, their value in the present, and their potential for the future. There's scarcely an arts organization in Scotland that Paul wasn't involved in, the Saltire Society. We were both on their publications committee, the Scottish Poetry Library, the Edinburgh Festival, the Advisory Council for the Arts in Scotland, of which he was convener, the National Theatre, the City of Literature. He lent his support, and often led the, the support, to an extraordinary array of cultural causes. That combination of experience in the army and in the diplomatic service was clearly a fertile training ground for dealing with recalcitrance and lethargy, and there was plenty of both to be dealt with. One thing he campaigned for, but didn't achieve, and which is close to my heart, is a museum of Scottish literature. I think few would disagree that the Writers' Museum, illuminating and evocative as it is, is only a beginning in presenting Scotland's literary culture to the world. It is something he and I talked about. He had a vision that was both resonant and practical. I'd love to think that Paul's legacy could be preserved by fulfilling that particular dream. Jenny made the perfect phrase for this event, energy and conviction. Those are the things I remember Paul Scott for. Paul brought energy to all the many things that you found yourself in the same room with Paul. He was a man who was not afraid to say what he thought, to fight for what he thought. In this very club, he and I as vegetarians, it was he who made sure that there was vegetarian food for the likes of us. When we sat on committees together, Paul always put his point forcefully, with conviction, and very often, people found themselves agreeing with him. I find myself very taken by the heading of the paper that came with this meeting, a life in books and a passion for Scotland. His energy and conviction are summed up in those two thoughts. Those of us who were lucky enough to visit with Paul and Laura and see Paul's astonishing library, we know that that only scratched the surface of his involvement with Scottish books. The more you read a 20th century life, the more you realize how many people Paul rubbed shoulders with as Scottish literature unfolded like a flower in the mid 20th century and later. The people he knew, the people he'd argued with, the people he'd probably inspired with, the people he'd tried to penetrate the ideas of with Gaelic. John Galt, a man who fascinated him, so he ended up writing a book about him and doing a postgraduate degree about him. A man who could take the Scottish the Saltire Society Book Award, and having it succeeded him in the chair of that, it's not a comfortable chair, Scott was able to keep the peace, to moderate people's views. You know what they say, if you ask two rabbis for an opinion, you'll get three opinions. Or well, you should try chairing the Scottish Book of the Year. <laughs> Paul did it for many years, and I was fortunate enough to succeed him. And I can only admire, in retrospect, the years in which he did it. To go and visit Paul and Laura, even in the later years, was to go and see an intelligence, two intelligence, but Paul burning still bright, even as it dimmed. The number of people he knew, the number of memories he could bring to Scottish literature. And it wasn't just backward looking. It was the fire of seeing a country in which he passionately believed and doing what he could to make its books available, prized if possible, and read. We cannot tackle the problems that face us without an educated population, he wrote. We have aspired to this in the past, 
and with control of our own affairs, I'm sure that we can do it again. There speaks the authentic voice of Paul. So I think we stand on the brink of an exciting new age, one which needs effort and determination, but which will transform the quality of life in Scotland and make some contribution to the rest of the world. Future generations will say of it, as Wordsworth said of the French Revolution, this was it in that dawn to be alive. Well, maybe. But Paul Scott, with a lifetime of passion and commitment, made it possible for Scottish literature in many ways to find publication, distribution, publicity, and encouragement for younger authors. And that will be his legacy. And for that, we honour him today. I remember the first time I met Paul, but I don't. I do remember the very first time I met Laura, and Paul was with her, but his presence was very brief because it was at a reception in the Signet Library, and in typical fashion, Paul was working the room. I was actually more interested in talking to Laura because I have a long and close association with Italy myself. And also, I suspect Paul was a little wary of getting into conversation with me. At the time, which seems a hundred years ago, I was a columnist in the Scotsman, and the, the Scotsman was a paper of some worth and distinction, I have to say. <laughs> um, and I had written an article in one of my columns about something which had already been referred to. Paul had launched himself into um, a Scottish cultural life, um, through, first of all, the Saltar Society, when he was the chief architect of its <coughs> advisory council on the arts to um, the Scottish Arts Council. Funny looking back at these old columns, which I still have yellowing and gathering dust somewhere in my attic, um, because, you know, the same debates are ongoing all these years later. Paul, I've written a, a piece about this effort to influence um, policy at the Arts Council, which, of which Paul was the chief architect, um, and um, I have described him rather mysteriously as the enigmatic writer and commentator Paul Scott. Years later, when we'd become friends and had met over many lunches and round at the flat, um, he looked at me in a rather puzzled and accusing way and said, uh, you want to describe me as enigmatic? What exactly did you mean? Well, this was 1980, 81, um, and the atmosphere, particularly in newspaper offices, was still feverish in the wake of the failed 79 referendum. Um, a rumor went around, which I have to say, and I hope he doesn't mind me giving him the authorship of this rumor, was, um, started by Neil Asherson, that Paul might well be an agent of the government. <laughs> Neil, who was a great conspiracy theorist, um, um, did believe that, that you know, actual provocateurs and the agents of the state would um, be at work in Scotland to find out what the next move of the SNP would be. Um, in actual fact, as we all now know, there was only one government of which Paul was an agent, and that was the first SNP government. Um, so, as I say, that was the background to my um, first experience with Paul. But one of my most memorable anecdotes is his 90th birthday party, which took place here in the new town, in the new club. Not my natural environment, I have to say, as an unreconstructed 70s feminist. I gather you're still required to wear ties coming in the door. Sorry, I forgot mine. Um, <laughs> It was a memorable occasion for many reasons, and it was attended by our recent First Minister, Alex Salmon, who gave a typically eloquent and very witty speech, drawing attention to Paul's wonderfully, almost outrageously frank um, autobiography, 
which I'm not sure would quite pass the uh, census of the Me Too movement these days. Those of you who have read it will know what I mean. Um, and uh, describing how Paul, during, the Cuban, during his time in Havana, and during the Cuban Missile Crisis, had, um, say, as Paul says modestly in the book, many people believed he had prevented a nuclear war <laughs> because he had been sent off to inspect the Cuban missile sites and, and, and assure the Americans that they were in fact being dismantled and the Russians were working very hard to remove them and load them onto ships. And when this word reached Washington, um, the, the temperature was toned down a bit. Um, Paul, I'm sure, typically did not believe he had personally been responsible for, um, for preventing a nuclear war, but uh, he certainly did um, give Alec a great deal of fuel on that particular evening. And I've been, um, I'm honored to have been entrusted by Laura to um, read a message from Alec, a tribute, his own tribute, um, an apology for not being here. I have to change my glasses at this point. Um, yeah. Uh, I well remember calling in at the new club for Paul's 90th birthday. And what a grand time we had, that was had by all. I'm really sorry that Moira and I cannot attend. As you know, we both thought the world of Paul, and I've penned the following brief tribute, which I hope is suitable. Paul was always kind enough to send me copies of his latest books, which means that a considerable section of my library is taken up by the works of Paul Henderson Scott. My favorites are undoubtedly his autobiographical works, A 20th Century Life, and it's a sequel, which I have the great pleasure of launching, and always told Paul should have been entitled A Diplomatic Scot. Um, these gripping and very funny pages detail Paul's splendid diplomatic career, ranging from the ridiculous accusation, false, by General de Gaulle that Paul had purloined the pen which he used to accept the German surrender in World War II, to the sublime when Paul and his little red sports car were instrumental in saving the entire planet during the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> However, it was in his return to Scotland that Paul found his true calling. He became the most prolific literary powerhouse of the national movement. His contribution across many organizations was immense and vital, particularly in the politically fallow period of the 1980s. It is my estimation that without Paul Scott, this nation would likely now be much further from reclaiming our independence, and certainly much worse intellectually prepared. We are all in Paul's debt, and in that of his lovely wife, Laura, for these 40 years of service to the cause of Scotland, signed Alex Salmond, First Minister of Scotland, 2007 to 2014. Okay? Thank you. Hello everyone. I was an adult before I acquired a love of Robert Burns. I was a much older adult before I acquired a love of Sir Walter Scott and that was entirely down to Paul who was horrified at my lack of knowledge about a writer he so admired. Because, of course, Paul Scott was an expert on Scottish literature, and he wrote on both Sir Walter Scott and Robert Burns. And in an address to the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club in 1996, Paul spoke of the links between the two men. I would like to, to read an extract from that. This is Paul's words. Scott himself, in language very reminiscent of Robert Burns, spoke of his Scottish feelings, prejudices, if you will, but which were born and will die with me. He used another phrase of Burns when he urged Alan Cunningham to undertake more ambitious literary projects for dear old Scotland's sake. This was the spirit in which Burns collected Scottish songs and Scott the border ballads. A tribute, as he said, to a country once proud and independent. 
Both Burns and Scott deeply regretted and resented the Union of 1707 and Scotland's loss of independence. Both were determined to resist, as far as they could, the erosion of Scottish identity. The collections of the songs and ballads were part of this resistance. So were the Waverley novels, and more obviously and politically, the letters of Malachi Malagrever. I shall always be proud of Malachi, Scott wrote in his journal in 1826, as having headed back the South Run, or helped to do so in one instance at least. Arms and Scott agreed too in their understanding of the means by which the Union was brought about. Arms in We are bought and sold for English gold, it's like a parcel of ropes in a nation. Scott in the chapter on the Union in his Tales of a Grandfather, where the strength of his feelings are clear from the vigour and passion of the language. The Scottish nation, he says, regarded the Union as a total surrender of their independence by their false and corrupted statesmen, despised by the English and detested by their own country. He asks whether the descendants of the noble lords and honourable gentlemen who accepted the bribes would be more shocked at the general fact of their ancestors being corrupted or scandalised at the paltry amount of the brain. In the whole of the 19th century, this chapter is virtually the only honest account of the Union transaction. In that century of British Empire, anything which questioned or discredited the Union was unwelcome and by general consent suppressed. This is why this aspect of Burns and Scott has been largely forgotten. It was not so in Scott's own time. When Robert Peel walked up the high street of Edinburgh in August 1822, through the crowd gathered for the royal visit, he said that Scott was everywhere recognised and the reaction of the people first gave him a notion of the electric shock of a nation's gratitude. The same word was used by Lord Meadowbank at the dinner in the assembly rooms in George Street at which Scott first publicly acknowledged that he had written the Waverley novels. We owe to him as a people, Meadowbank said, a large and heavy debt of gratitude. And he explained why. It was due to Scott that the fame of our ancestors who fought for independence and liberty was no longer confined to Scotland. He it is who has confirmed a new reputation on our national character and bestowed on Scotland an imperishable name. I'd like to end with Robert Burns. Robert Burns wrote a small, simple, I think wonderful epitaph on his own friend. <coughs> An honest man here lies at rest, as ere God with his image blessed, the friend of man, the friend of truth, the friend of age and guide of youth. Few hearts like his with virtue worn, few heads with knowledge so informed, if there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there is none, he made the best of this. That's how I feel about my friend Paul Henderson's quote. Cosmopolitanism has had a bad press in recent years. The last Tory Prime Minister, but one or two, and they come thick and fast, well, thick anyway, maybe not, maybe not fast enough, said that the citizen of, of everywhere was a citizen of nowhere. Cosmopolitanism is an important contribution, and a cosmopolitan culture is an important balance to nationalism. When I think of Paul Scott, um, I think of him above all as perfectly astride that balance, a man of wide international outlook on the one hand and a man of deep national sentiment on the other, and the two were not and should never be separated. I met him first of all, and I do remember it very clearly, at the Italian Institute here in Edinburgh. In some ways, although I myself aspire to biculturalism, and that was what we discussed that evening, in retrospect, and especially having read his autobiography, I think I did him a disservice in the sense that his culture was much wider than merely bicultural. 
Nevertheless, in the autobiography, he does give a pride of place to Italy. And I find the very title of the chapter of one of his books, Milan and Thoughts of Scotland, very, very significant. Um, in Milan, he wrote, in fact, it wasn't his first book, but the one which started him on his later literary career, the book on the Union of Scotland and England, the Union of 1707. Um, he went on to write, and I quote, Italy had enriched my life in many ways, but he did add, and let's not forget this, or indeed, let's not forget her. Now, the second part of that sentence was, but meeting Laura has been the most important of all to me. I'm not going to talk about Laura, I don't want to embarrass her, but none of us who are here will in any way fall short of our affection for her, and nor in any way underestimate the importance that she had in the life of Paul. He went on to say that there seemed to me a fundamental affinity between the Italians and the Scots, and we blend in well together. He goes on to mention uh, particular names, the artist Alberto Morocco and, of course, uh, Richard DeMarco, and no gathering in Edinburgh would be complete unless the name Richard DeMarco came up at some point. So I'll mention him just in case, just in case no one else does. Um, I worked a little with Paul over uh, one particular feature. When Frank Dunlop was director of the Edinburgh Festival, there was one year, and I can't remember which one it was, then they featured Italy as being central to that particular year. I was invited by the Saltire Society to prepare a program which went on at St. Cecilia's Hall, and which was eventually published, not by the Saltire Society, but by the Italian Institute, with the title of From the Tweed to the Tiber. Um, the piece was put on, directed by George Bruce, but I turned to Paul for some assistance on it, which of course he very generously gave, identifying Scottish writers who had written about Italy or Italian writers who had written about Scotland. I was somewhat dismayed when I then discovered that Paul was also reviewing this show for the Scotsman, and in the course of his generally laudatory review he said he thought it was too long. I puzzled over that, whether long was um, a euphemism for bloody boring, but nonetheless, he in general approved of it. In other words, it seems to me that if we celebrate above all Paul for what he has done for Scotland, for Scottish nationalism in a wide sense, for Scottish culture in any sense you like, then we should bear in mind the fact that if he, as um, well, as we said earlier on, brought Scotland to the world through such organisations as Penn. At the same time, he was equally keen that Scotland should be aware of a wider world and, above all, of the wider, um, of the wider European context in which we move. I think that will be his contribution, that he advanced the self-pride of Scotland, but at the same time, he extended Scotland's own cultural reach. That seems to me to be an enormous contribution. Friendship is such a potent force. Um, my name is Hazel Gardner. I'm the convener of the Saltar Society, Aaron Branch. And I have here a copy of a well-exposed book this afternoon. The inscription in this book holds a story that Laura has asked me to tell for the second time. Perhaps time will not allow the full telling this afternoon, but I will supply a transcript to Laura and you can read it in full there. The first telling was also in Edinburgh at a meeting of the local Saltire Society. Paul was in the room and present Today, though he is not in the room, I hope that the telling brings that very warm, very kind sense of his presence to us all. The inscription reads to Hazel, a new and dear friend, Paul Henderson Scott, which is quite amazing, really. I first read a copy in Castleview, the family home on Arran, of which I had found myself custodian in 2011. 
the responsibility of family heritage combining with a vote was enormous. So when this book was passed to me, I read it dutifully, then avidly. And then by the time I had finished, I had two notebooks of thoughts and quotes, and that was not enough. I wrote to the author expressing all that was in me, filling several pages about loss. And believe me, loss of a parent is devastating. Heritage, culture. Timings past and future history. Imagining a discourse between us and concluding, I should love such a conversation. The reply came kindly soon and handwritten, come to Edinburgh. The conversation that followed, as you can well imagine, was held as only Paul could do. Sitting in the room overlooking the city with Laura and Paul, my realities were examined, my understandings interrogated, my historical omissions tolerated, and my belief almost respected until he concluded with an exasperated, as you can well imagine, to Laura, why is she here? I seem so diametrically opposite to everything, the enormity of his contribution to Scotland, to history, to culture, to the nation. And this last from Aaron was sitting there saying, like Linda, but this was my education. I'm fully educated, I'm a lifelong learner. And there are things in your book I've never heard of. I did not know that there had been a Scottish Parliament before. Laura gently said, she's here because she wants to know. She didn't know before, and now she has read your book, and she wants to know what else there is to know. Ah, ah said Paul, turning to face me once more this time smiling. Have you heard of the Saltar Society? He began. And what do you understand of independence? With Paul and Laura's encouragement, I attended Saltar Celebrates at the Mitchell Library. I loved the experience. It resounded deeply with a childhood full of verse and sang and Kayleigh evenings that started in one house with music and then ended it in another with traditional dancing or recitation long into the night and early into the morning. Within 18 months, I began to organise Saltar Society events on Arran with the support of Jim Tuff and a dozen of Arran's finest. The Saltar Arran branch was the first branch to be started in 30 years. We now have five syllables under our belt and many faces have visited us to share. Equally, we have shared in turn all that Aaron has to offer and the two have been a heady combination. Our most recent speaker, James Robertson, sitting amongst us, was welcomed to the nursery, to the primary school, to the secondary school, who loved his reading of the Gruffalo, and in them he has planted a personal experience of Scots that will never be forgotten.
And the thing for me is that the remit given to me when I was invited onto the board was to run the Aran branch and run it well. And for me, as an educator, that had to be holding the history and passing the history to the next generation. People make up their own minds about all sorts of things, but they make up their minds better when they know who they are. As I say, Paul is not in the room and there have been many tears amongst all of us. But let me simply say to you that today we gather and are given a torch to carry to join his voice with our voice and to shine into society the truth of our nation the consistency of Scottish culture, unique and diverse on the world stage through our stories and voices, telling our times with our history held in our hands, a telling without restraint or omission. Before I finish, I'll just say about the second statement and what do you understand of independence? I was interviewed by ITV and they asked me, what do you know of independence? What does Alex Salmond need to do to convince others? A hand passed me a book and I held the book up high. It was Paul's book launched at five o'clock that evening and on national news by eight o'clock that night. For me to be able to tell Paul that that is how events had happened at my first ever conference was an enormous joy. Friends give to us and Paul and Laura gave to me in so many ways at such a bleak time not just of history and heritage, but of friendship, little touches, come for coffee, join us for lunch, walk into this big room of strangers with us so that you're not alone. These little touches, for me, hold as much of the greatness of the man as the greatness of everything we will hear this afternoon. Friendship is such a potent force. And I'm so thankful that Paul extended his to me and that Laura and I continue in friendship. Thank you. In case you've lost your list, I'm Rosemary Gorham. Um, there have been a lot of memories so far. Um, my memory of first meeting Paul was not particularly glorious. It was at the Scottish Arts Club and I probably had one glass of wine too many. Um, and I was so in awe of his reputation. I mean, he had such a formidable reputation. I was quite a young woman at the time. I sat next to him and I didn't say a word the whole evening. I'm glad to say that that quickly changed, although I wished at the time I'd known he'd been a great John Galt fan because that was something we might have talked about then. But I'd learned about Paul Scott a couple of years before that first meeting when I went on my first day to my first serious grown-up job, which was at WNR Chambers, the publishers, in Annandale Street. And as all of you know, Chambers was the great lexicographical giant in Scotland at that time. People from Collins who think otherwise, we can discuss that later. But when I went into this amazing old-fashioned former um, meat factory, um, they had these glorious chambers red dictionaries all around the walls. But there was also another little red book, um, perhaps not the right phrase for it, but it was this one which Ian Gordon Brown started his um, recollections with. This was the book that Paul edited with George Bruce, a Scottish postbag, which is 800 years of Scottish letters. This was commissioned rather, um, I think, very 
farsightedly by the Scottish Post Office, and we could be due another one, if you like, to, to improve its, its um, position. But the Scottish Post Bag was a very rare book for Chambers at that time, because it was non-fiction, but not a dictionary, and they were in cock-a-hoop about how well it was doing. And at this point, Paul first kind of entered my consciousness as one of the great figures of Scottish culture. And I thought what I would just do this afternoon was read one of these letters. I mean, it starts right from the days of William Wallace, and it comes virtually up to our own time. It was published in 1986, which was sort of the cutoff point. But what I really like about this letter is from Hugh McDermott, and it's to the fellow editor, George Bruce, who obviously produced this from his drawer somewhere. But what I really like about this letter is that in some ways, I feel it could actually have been written by Paul, who on some days could be just about as trenchant as McDermott. And it, this letter, I think, doesn't just sound like something that Paul would have agreed with, but that he actually could have written. It's very short. This was from Brown's Bank in 1971. Dear George, just a line to congratulate you on the Glasgow University Fellowship and wish you the best of luck with it. I've just been listening to the bookmark discussion on Arts Council grants to authors. I think university fellowships much better, although I would never have liked one myself. Just imagine. Anyhow, so far as encouragement of literature is concerned, I think one criterion should be that nothing popular or likely or designed and intended by the author to give the public what it wants should be encouraged at all. <laughs> but on the contrary, discouraged by every possible means. Literary value is not a matter of opinion. There are objective standards, independent altogether of whether many people, or indeed any, like or dislike a particular work or not. All the best to Mrs. Bruce and yourself. <laughs> Joy Hendry, editor of Chapman, and it's as that that my first experience of Paul Henderson Scott happened almost certainly in something like 1972 or 73 in terms of subscription to the magazine when it was nowhere unknown, unheard, um, and unrecognised. But Paul did, Paul got his subscription in more or less straight away. He must be one of the mythical 2,000 people who are involved in and run absolutely everything in Scotland. He's most certainly one of them. I think he's one of ten, actually. <laughs> just, 2,000 is far too many. <clears throat> when Laura first told me of his death, the lines from Sorry McLean came to my mind immediately, and this is by way of apology to Laura, because I promised to send her the lines by email, and I didn't. The world is still beautiful, though you are not in it. These lines occur to me when somebody I care deeply about dies. Um, it's particularly appropriate in the case of Paul, because Paul, um, in spite of the RP of his spoken voice, took on the indigenous languages of Scotland, learned Gaelic, inspired by the poetry of Sorley MacLean. I also like these lines because they make you think about the world being still beautiful. I mean, look at this. There's a beauty there in these rainbow greys. And Paul opened our eyes to a kind of new beauty of Scotland that we'd almost stop seeing. And the world is so much more beautiful because Paul Henderson Scott was in it. And he's a kind of miracle. And I'd like to, in some ways, understand what made him tick. He was always a bit of a mystery. But I got to know him very well. Now, I'm temperamentally anti-establishment. Um, I'm, I'm a, a mixed-class parentage, a proper, very respectable, sort of Farfarian uh, doctors and ministers and all that sort of thing on the one hand, and uh, the most down-to-earth, downtrodden of Dundee working class on the other. And as far as my emotions go, it's the Dundee lot that I have it all the time. So Paul's kind of, even his accent, kind of grated on me at first. And who was this chap who kept writing 
to the newspapers. The Scotsman, Paul Henderson Scott. Oh, that's a Chapman subscriber, jolly good. What's he writing about? National theatres, national broadcasting, institutions. Now, again, the bristle, the, the bristle in my back sort of, um, I was, was up at that because Chapman was always, and I am, I am too, was always kind of anti-establishment, looking for things that were wrong, looking for things that needed to be put right, not accepting the status quo. But I became gradually drawn in over the years to Paul by Paul. He kept trying to involve me in different causes of one, one or another, committees of one sort or another. And at first I resisted. Um, but when he came back to Scotland, I was struck by uh, every, every talk I went to, every talk I gave, because by that time, about 10 years after starting Chapman, um, I was beginning to play a public role. I was terribly young when I started it, so I mean, I was nobody from nowhere. Um, and, I, and every single time, there was Paul Henderson Scott in the front row asking questions. Every conference you go to, there was Paul Scott in the front row asking the same questions about a national theatre, about why we didn't have national broadcasting, and, and, and. I mean, you could just about write the script for him and something, please, Paul, don't ask that again. But, but... When somebody suggested the absurd idea of a Scottish poetry library, absurd, absurd to some, who was there in the front line fighting for it? Paul Scott, Scottish Writers Against the Bomb, which I was involved in as well, Jenny mentioned it earlier. Paul Scott was in there fighting for it. When the Scottish Constitutional Convention was formed, it was formed because of a, a, a scheme of Paul Scott's to get a committee together to look at the Scottish claim of right, which he also got me on. And I could go on. But that man was wheeling and dealing behind the scenes at so many things that we, we, can't, we take them all for granted now. I'd like to mention one huge achievement of Paul. And he used to get me involved. He used to send me abroad uh, on, 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 on Scottish pen business particularly about languages. There came, I'm not sure of my dates, probably late 80s, to International Pen, a proposal from Scottish Pen that there be an international um, committee set up to look at the whole business of minority and particularly indigenous languages. Now, about 10 years later, there was a huge conference in Barcelona, 1996, at which the International Declaration of Linguistic Rights was signed, sealed, and pockled to, through UNESCO, given UN stamping and all the rest of it. Guess who started it? <laughs> Paul Scott. So you go from a proposal penned by Paul Scott to Scottish Pen to International Pen, and the whole world is involved. Literally, from uh, New Zealand to Eskimo land and everywhere in between. Hundreds and hundreds of people all doing their stuff for minority language because of Paul Scott. Now, how did he do it? Well, <laughs> I think he had an ear of unassailability. He had worked very hard at educating himself and was a hugely um, broad-minded, um, intelligent, sensitive man of culture. He'd done his homework. But he had a vision. But he presented that vision in a way that seemed quite unassailable, not arguable with, no prisoners taken. And he sailed through all with, I mean, <laughs> the kind of certainty that you get from Toad Hall going poop, poop on the motorway, quite certain that all will completely fall beneath his motor car or the swan of Tuilola, sailing through the realms of the dead. Now, we were the realms of the half-dead in the 1970s and 80s, and it's thanks to Paul Scott that we're not, that we're coming alive, we're getting to know ourselves. And I'd finally like to mention his sidekick, Bert Davis, not a sidekick at all. The pair of them were schemers. And I, I will always remember, with great fondness, the way they ambushed me when I produced the Scottish Theatre issue of Chapman, because they saw it as the launching pad for a Scottish national theatre. They knew how to see a chance, grasp it, 
and take it to fruition. To use that as one example, the National Theatre of Scotland almost certainly would not exist if it were not for Paul Henderson Scott. So if there's any Paul Henderson Scots in the premises or in the world, please step forward because we need you now. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to celebrate with you Paul and I's love for a global vision for Scotland. For a wee year, before Christmas in your day, I used to bring in claret for Bordeaux for the family of my godson, William Johnston. Paul was a customer and would frequently pre the claret together when I delivered it to his house. This is William Dunbar's tongue-in-cheek ditch to James IV persuading him to leave the provincial gloom of oh, Stirling, his hunting castle at Stirling, where there was no good food, no good wine, and to come to the sensual delicts of Edinburgh, to his metropolitan palace of Holyrood. And the poem goes, We that are here in heaven's glory, to you that are in purgatory, commends us in your heartly wise, I mean we folk in paradise, in Edinburgh, with all meriness to you of Stirling in distress. <laughs> or presence nor delight is, but pity this epistle write us. Och, ye hermits and hanker sidles that touch your penance at your tables, and eats nocht meat restorative nor drinks ne wine comfortative. Ye may in heaven here we us dwell, to eat swan, cran, petric, and cleaver, and every fish that swims in the river, to drink with us the new fresh wine that grew upon the river of Rhine, fresh, fragrant claret out of France, of Angers and Orléans, with many a course of great dainty, say ye, Amen. For charity. Can I could wail ye precious minute to the old alliance to travel back in time to. It would be the New Year's Day, 1537, in Notre Dame Cathedral, at the Wadden Ur King James V and the French Princess Marlene de Valois. Fortunately, it was captured by one of France's finest markers, Pierre de Ronsard, but described it thus Ur King of Scots. Son port est soit royal, son regard vigoureux, de vertu et d'honneur et de guerre amoureux, la douceur et la force illustrent son visage, comme si Vénus et Mars en avoir fait partage. His bearing was the regal, his luck fou a smedum, vertu, honor, and amorous engagement, douceness and vert lifted up his face as again Venus and Mars had conjoined at its marking. I see her back, stoked my dark as a claret importer a number of years later. So when Paul Whelet shows my book, The Scottish World, as his book of the year and yen of the Christmas book supplements, I can assure you it had no to do with maintaining his supply of Chateau Lafitte. <laughs> but boy, did I appreciate the support of such a giant of Scottish culture. Or twenty extracts for the book. One of the pleasures of doing programmes about Scots abroad is that ye body I leads to another body. And it was in a fjord outside Bergen, in Edvard Grieg's house at Trollhagen, that I was first told about Peter Das, the son of Peter Dundas v Dundee, who was the greatest Baroque poet of 17th century in Norway, and whose hymns are still sung in Norwegian and Danish kirks to this day. And I our set his hymn, eh, Altar and Sacrament, into his other mother tongue. He'd have been broke up speaking Norwegian and Scots. A verse. O Jesus at our altar fit, we boo our knee to bend. And there we seek a soft remit, our dwine and souls to mend. Your holy bidden gars us come and tear your wadden board to feed upon your manna. Give us a blessed taste, O Lord, that we can give both laud and gloire and sing a lewd hosanna. And finally, 
another wheel kent screever for another four flung eight that appeals to the expansive vision of global Scottishness hailed by Paul that I cherish in my own head. And I'm going to share Paul would have kent this extra to this poem. And I think about him in Cuba, up in the hulls, to content that the Western world would survive and having a glisk over the Russian missiles so that he could tell the Americans they, they calm down, everything was going to be all right. This is Lermontov screaming about his Lermont forebears at him in Scotland. Pod zanadesio tumana, pod nevambur sredis tibay, stait magila osiana vgorach shatlandi magay. In the quarries of my Scotland, under a har of cold mists, atween a lift of storms and dry sons, the grave of Ossian exists. Laura, we were gay, gay proud to ken Paul Scott as a friend. Say so thank you for inviting me and Joan here today. Thanks very much. It was something of a stooshy, quite a considerable stooshy, in the front office of the Scotsman. Then uh, still a great paper, and then, and then still in North Bridge. What came down to the editorial floor that a very patrician gentleman was demanding to see the editor, Sir Alistair Dunnett. Now, there were just two problems. One, Sir Alistair Dunnett was no longer the editor. Two, the then editor was Eric Mackay, a very reclusive Aberdonian who had as little to do with his readers as possible. <laughs> he actually had as little to do with his staff as possible also. <laughs> so, at that time, I was the features editor of the paper and I took Paul for a coffee, and I was at once impressed. I was impressed by his confidence. He said he intended to develop something he described as a new and more cerebral approach to Scottish nationalism. He was convinced that this would help the SNP, and I think he was absolutely right. It certainly did not take Paul long to embark on his project. A veritable torrent of articles, essays, letters to editors, and then, of course, books followed, books of a very high quality. I don't want to say much more. I just want to conclude by saying that Paul was indeed a literary and a cultural phenomenon, and his contribution to our country cannot and must not be overrated. He was a genuine and a most distinguished Scottish patron. Thank you. I'm um, the fear. To echo one of the earlier speakers, if you didn't came for arm, since you tint your, tint your bit of your paper, I'm Jimmy Reid Baxter. We heard about Paul and his internationalism, his love for Italy. We heard about the need to speak the languages of the world. We also heard about Paul's patrician accent. And I'm trying to find in here a poem that shows that Paul's patrician accent didn't prevent him from kenning not only Gaelic, wasn't the only language he learnt, but he wrote in Scots and Ireland. And unfortunately, since this wasn't what I was 
prepared to be doing, I can't have found it. Paul Scott, I never let you do it like that. He was, I prepared it. There's an article about the history of Scott's language in here. Been in here than the previous, than uh, Billy Kay. Start at the age of 92. Joy spoke wonderfully about the rainbow greys, the beauty in Edinburgh, even on a day like this. Reiki to a thousand. Third in bar, it was the merry tune. Ferguson cried at the county hall, and like a key could glow in heaven forby. Here, Hume transformed human thought and gave bean dinners to his friends. Clark Maxwell, as a bairn at school, screamed a paper for the Royal Society. For they that hear the lugs to hear, they splores high jinks, high thoughts, still echo rune closes, winds, houfs, and new tune dry rooms. In our end time, Garriach and Smith were gay sib to Ferguson themselves. The sheer beauty of the place, I lifts the head. A beauty which some had done their best to harsh. Further's muckle to Gary, it grew in all Reiki and in all Scotland they days. Poor death, ignorance and hopelessness, shoddy biggins, ill health, early death. A man the worst in Europe, to our shame. Cheek be jowl with commercial greed, affluence, mobile phones, and jaunts to Bangkok. After 300 year on a government, or miss government. But now, there's a Glasgow hope. At least we hae our parliament back. Rained yet be Westminster, but sin will ding the traces down. Our lang, our cause for equality and social justice, he fawn on deaf and distant lugs. Soon we shall bid a new and fairer Scotland, where Reiki, a real capital, in smear. Amen to those words of Paul Scott. I met Paul through the Salter Society, which we've heard a lot about. Paul's vision didn't just extend across the world, inspiring all those people. I didn't know that m amazing story that Joy told us about the petition of the UNESCO recognition of minority languages. Paul's vision ranged back in time, as well as into the future of, of Edinburgh, Reiki, a real capital in Smear. And one of the things that Paul most loved, and we heard again earlier on today about it, was the idea of a national theatre, such as had existed. He loved the satire of the three estates. And he liked this poem that I wrote. To Sir David Lindsay, Defensor Scotia. The land you lewd, we hurt, and harms is hine. Her glory is done and done and gain to glory, the memory of her mervels out of mind, wished wine to water which ah went or war. The dance did fill with flaming dreams and fire her sun's sweet signs, or ere her death would dare to live at liberty, nor menseless mire their souls in sickless swoons, and doutous dire, and ain't the right to breathe. Be blithe and ring in this loved land that did your spirit inspire. Clean gain is grace and growth and court and king. Yet, lion, you dwell I upon the hechts, and your good works shall yet set all to rechts. 
And if anybody ever bequeathed good works to Scotland to set things to rights, it was Paul Scott, enabled for 40 years as we heard, by Laura reaffirming the bonds between Scotland and the heart of Western civilization in Italy. such a company today is a legacy of Paul's that's crucially important. Jamie was right when he said just now that one of Paul's great virtues was not only to plan for the future but to go back into the past and retrieve it. McDermott, Hugh McDermott ends his poem Gernscoil with the lines, the present is theirs, meaning the disposition that rules the roost at the current time. But all the past and the future is ours. For me, it started, I guess, in the 1970s when the headmaster of the school that I was at in Kent, of all places, having been born in darkly sectarian post industrial Warwickshire, uh, told me that I should find out about Hugh McDermott. Because here was a poet now, writing in the 1970s, his work in Scots, I should know about. I did, and when I went to the University of Cambridge, one of our great teachers there was a formidable and inopunable uh, woman called Helena Many Shire. And noting her enthusiasm for Scottish literature, Helena told myself and a friend, go to Edinburgh now and find that man called Bert Davis. And it was Bert Davis who led the way for me encounter Paul Scott. And of course Bert Davis and Paul Scott together produced that wonderful collection of essays called The Age of McDermott. But when I met him in uh, Edinburgh, his uh, immediate comment at the end of our conversation was, well, would you like me to get hold of Sorley MacLean and Robert Garriach and drive them down to Cambridge for a poetry reading? We were flabbergasted and that's what happened. It's the company, it's, the, it's not a matter of networking, it's a matter of being in that present tense where the company that you're in actually has those connections which draw on the past and point to the future in such a way. Sorley McLean and Robert Garriach came to Cambridge, came down to Cambridge and gave an unforgettable reading which staggered everybody. And then coming back up to Scotland after that to meet Paul Scott for the first time, and to be encountering his works, his publications, and the legacy that he was building uh, in the early 80s through all of these activities that we heard of was leading us into, leading me into that company uh, which broadened and continues to broaden. Um, he, uh, well, I went to New Zealand for 14 years and then I came back and the very first, I think, if not the first, one of the first events I took part in was giving a lecture on Hugh McDermott at uh, the Toft Combs Hotel, as it was called then, just outside of Bigger. And you'll recognize the image. I came in um, sitting right in the front row. <laughs> We'd met before, so I knew that he was going to be listening attentively and critically to everything that I was going to say. So I said what I said and gave the lecture, had given the lecture the title, uh, Hugh McDermott from then till now, from Victoria's Empire, to L. McPherson. And I ended the lecture with an image which I had got permission to use um, of L. McPherson in a two piece tartan outfit and recounted this in the book which Paul asked me to contribute to, the book called Spirits of the Age, the Spirit of the Age, the Age of McDermott, the Age of Paul Scott. Um, there's an L. McPherson advert from the late 1970s, which shows the model in a tartan bra and underpants drawn, turning defiantly to two burly looking men who seem a little threatening in the foreground. The words at the top of the advert read, 
It's McPherson clan tartan. Who wants to know? <laughs> Paul was sitting next to a gentleman, and I'm not sure if he might be here today, but the person sitting next to him was not entirely sure about this illustration, and you could see that he was slightly unsettled. And Paul had been sitting there totally attentively, but with a complete serious look on his face. When I finished the lecture, I could hear the two of them in the front row. His friend turned to him and said, well, what did you think of that? And just this beaming smile started to come from Paul. And he said, very good, very good. <laughs> I described that, by the way, to a friend, another friend of mine suggested gently that displayed a note of self-determination that signaled a common cause shared by the discourse of nationalism and the discourse of feminism. My friend said he thought there was a slight problem there because it also evoked the discourse of capitalism and took place entirely within it. Yes, I said, which proves my final point, that even within ideologies that seem inescapable, we may find the strategies of our own liberation. Let me end with a poem, since we're talking about that company of great writers and critics and cultural provocateurs, those Walking up here this afternoon, I was recollecting having lunch with David Dykes at the Caledonian Hotel and being here having lunch with Paul here um, on a number of occasions over the years. A company of people whose effort was to enable that revitalization. There's work to do, there's damage to be done still. But so much already has been made possible by such people and especially by Paul. So let me end with a short poem, um, which is in the words of Neil Gunn. Uh, I met Neil Gunn's nephew, Dermot, and had always been haunted by the first chapter of Neil Gunn's novel, The Well at the World's End. And after talking to Dermot uh, about his uncle, I uh, thought the time had come. So following McDermott's example in some respects, I transcribed some of the words from that first chapter and sent it then to Dermot, who gave his approval and thankfully, not only his approval, but told me that he thought that Neil himself would have approved. So the sentiment, what the poem is saying, is far more important than who wrote it. But it brings Neil Gunn also into this company. The well at the world's end. When you look deep down to the pebbles at the bottom of the well and see them blue and brown and beautifully clean, and it seems that as th although the well has gone dry, the pebbles themselves and the air all around them somehow retain the memory of water. Just as pebbles in a cave keep the memory of the sea. And the shadows of ferns and the earth bank beside you mottle the well with flakes of summer sunlight coming through the trees. And when you lift the heavy fronds and look more closely in, and then start back to return along the road to the house with its garden and the old lady there who told you of the well and the water you would find there and you speak to her and tell her there's no water in the well and she says oh yes there's always water in the well you might then turn again and go back through the trees to look once again and prove to yourself, knowing you can always see the surface of the water, the difference there is between the air and water, and that all you have to do now is pick up a pebble or two. But you pause because you cannot move and your eyes stare hard and fast, held by some strange spirit there, invisible, inside, and you reach your hand down, slowly, and your hand goes into the water. That's something that you did not think was there. Water so bright, adventure so near, deception so close, experience ubiquitous as light, and the feel of that frozen bangle of ice at your wrist, and the knowledge you'll take with you of the treasures in the kist. Whatever it is that stays visible and clear in the now and the here, 
of the whole world and people in a place like this hold dear. hour and 20 minutes I feel like I've been living the last 35 years of my life. It's astonishing all these links and connections and the, the, the common factor in all of them is Paul. Um, I was just delighted to see that poster, Scottish Writers Against the Bomb. I've got a copy of that somewhere in an attic, in a box in an attic as well because when that came out I was, I think I really had a couple of poems published somewhere and uh, I remember getting that and sticking it up on the wall and adding my name into that amazingly long and distinguished list um, in black ink so that it looked as though it had been printed out as well. Uh, and then uh, um, all these other things that we mentioned, all the connection with Scottish Pen and, and, uh, and uh, the, 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 the huge amount of work that, Scott, that Paul did uh, for languages, the, the languages of Scotland, Gaelic and also of Scots. And, and again through Penn. I remember they, not long after the, the Parliament was established and they set up, there were all kinds of, of, uh, of cross-party groups of this, that and the next. And there was one about Scots, which, uh, which I belonged to. And one of the first things we decided we better do was, would be to, to write a specific document about the, the, the rights and the principles of the rights of Scots. And this was based upon the international uh, statement of principles, the linguistic rights document that we've had about already. And uh, so some of us were designated to write this thing. And they're all, apart from Paul, we're all in the room today. <laughs> there was Joy, and there was Colin Denati, who's here somewhere, and there was me and Paul, and we all used to gather in Joy's office, uh, Chapman office, and we would, we would sit around the table and we had this thing out together. And I picked it off the shelf the other day. And, uh, and there it is, and it's written in Scots, and we all argued about how dense the Scots should be, and, how, and so on and so forth. But Paul was absolutely in there, uh, shaping this, and determined that we should get it right. And it was a wee thing, and it kind of it happened, and then it kind of disappeared a wee bit. But I looked at three the other day, and I thought, it's still valid, and everything that's in it, I still stand by it, and I know Paul would as well. So I wanted to try and tie two things together very briefly. One, about his passion for Scottish literature and literature in Scots. And the other thing was his passion for and huge knowledge of uh, the work of Walter Scott, which Linda Fabiani's already touched on. Um, because I really, I met Paul for the first time in the mid-1980s, as so many other folk did, when I'd come back to Edinburgh after a a gap after my first degree to do a PhD, and the PhD I ended up writing was in the history department, but it was about the work of Walter Scott, who I hadn't really been that familiar, I hadn't really been familiar with his work at all until I started doing that work. But the thing that had triggered it was a book written by Paul Henderson Scott called Walter Scott in Scotland, which was published in 1981. And it's a very slim book, but it's an absolutely a book packed with information and ideas. And I think that triggered something for me to, to, to realize I had to go and find out about Walter Scott, such an important cat figure in our history for all kinds of reasons, about whom I knew virtually nothing and whose work I had never read. And uh, interestingly as well, that book was published by Blackwoods, still publishing at that point in Thistle Street. And there were other publishers still publishing uh, in the new town and the old town of Edinburgh at that point. Rosemary's mentioned Chambers, who she used to work with. They were on Annandale Street. There was TNT Clark, a, a publisher of religious uh, books, still publishing in George Street. And there was Blackwoods, uh, an important part of the of the, the age of Walter Scott, still publishing. And uh, Paul's book uh, Scott, on Walter Scott Scotland and also his new edition of the Letters of Malachi and Malachi that were published by Blackwoods. And then a few years later, Blackwoods uh, folded. Um, so there's a direct link there. And I think one of the reasons Paul loved being in this place 
is he could look out there and I think he felt himself to be absolutely linked and immersed in this ancient city, both in the present, but also I think he almost felt that he was part of that age from a couple of hundred years earlier. So for me, uh, one of the things that I will, I will always remember is the quite vigorous arguments that Paul and I used to have about um, Walter Scott and his attitude to the Union. And it's not, I think we differed quite a bit on that. We were absolutely in agreement that Scott was a massively important figure who everybody who had any interest in Scottish culture and Scottish literature in particular should know something about. And we lamented the fact that he was not as well read or as well known as he had been. And we differed about other aspects of his work. Um, and that was great and that was fine. And you could have vigorous discussions and arguments with Paul and uh, it didn't alter your friendship one little bit. So I thought that I would read a wee bit from um, one of Scott's novels, Rob Roy, um, because it seems to me a perfect summation uh, of, uh, of one of the key parts of, of Paul's life, which of course was his passion for Scottish independence. Um, and uh, it's the extract when the, 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 the narrator of the, of the novel, and, um, uh, Frank Osbaldiston, is riding north into the Trossachs uh, uh, with Nicol Jarvie, Bailey Nicol Jarvie, accompanying him, uh, uh, along with uh, Frank's servant, manservant, Andrew Fair Service. And you get two sides of the argument for and against the Union here, beautifully captured in two paragraphs of Walter Scott. Bailey Nicol Jarvie entertained me as we passed along, sorry, this is set in uh, um, just a few years after the, the Union, so it's all raw material, as it were. Bailey Nicol Jarvie entertained me as we passed along with an account of remarkable events which had formerly taken place in the scenes through which we passed. And as he was well acquainted with the ancient history of his district, he saw with the prospective eye of an enlightened patriot the buds of many of those future advantages which have only blossomed and ripened within these few years. I remarked also, and with great pleasure, that although a keen Scotchman and abundantly zealous for the honour of his country, he was disposed to think liberally of the sister kingdom. When Andrew Fairservice, whom, by the way, the bailey could not abide, <laughs> chose to impute the accident of one of the horses casting his shoe to the deteriorating influence of the Union, he incurred a severe rebuke from Mr. Javi. Bish, sir, bish. It's ill scraped tongues like yours that mark mischief between neighbourhoods and nations. There's nothing say good on this side of time, but it mixed it in better. And that may be said of the Union. Nain were keener against it than the Glasgow folk, with their rablins and their risings and their mobs, as they call them nowadays. But it's an ill wind blows nobody get. Let Ilka Ain roost the ford as they find it. I say, let Glasgow flourish. Book is judiciously and elegantly bitten round the tune's arms by way of byword. No, since St. Mungo catched herons in the Clyde, what was ever like to Garris flourish like the sugar and tobacco trade? Will anybody tell me that and grumble at the treaty that opened us a road west of all yonder? Andrew Fairservice was far from acquiescing in these arguments of expedience and even ventured to enter a grumbling protest that it was an unker change to his Scotland's laws made in England and that for his share he wouldn't for all the hen barrels in Glasgow and all the tobacco casks to boot he'd gain up the riding of the Scots Parliament or send a war croon and a sword and a scepter and mons neck to be keep it by the English Pope puddens in the Tower of London what would Sir William Wallace or old Davy Lindsay he said to the Union, or them that made it? And I think it's a beautiful summation, not necessarily one without taking sides, of the argument that we're still discussing to this day. And I just wondered what Paul would have made of the last nine months of cluster bureaus that we've been living through. And I wondered how eagerly he would be awaiting the next few weeks as we go towards this next general election. <laughs> I think he's in the back of my mind as I go forward to it. Thank you very much.
about that. A recent email from Lara was headed Saltai Matters. Yes, she raised some, but principally she was highlighting for me what Paul Henderson Scott, for the best part of a century, unceasingly did for the Saltai society, and consequently what really mattered for him, his country, Scotland. Arguably, in a bewildered country with the Prime Minister only one more trip away from his murky ditch, the work and indeed mission of the Saltire Society matter more than ever. And those of us who are members, or who ought to be members, owe it to Paul and his cohorts to play active parts for championing the arts and culture of Scotland especially now in Europe. Girded loins may be uncomfortable, but my goodness, they encourage action. And Paul showed us action that really does lead to achievement. With the Saltire Society's first centenary only now seven and a bit years off, today's celebration has given me as its latest convener the opportunity to appreciate the quality of the seeds sown and their subsequent careful watering by Paul and his co-visionaries. Public lectures, discussions, readings, promotions, performances, art shows, involvement, lobbying, persistence, Never, I suspect, someone to take no for an answer or a challenge not worth taking up. Paul has left us not entirely free of frustrations. We still, as we heard earlier on, need a National Museum of Scottish Literature, a higher profile in schools for Scots history, literature and languages, and now increasingly in music. We've got the stories and the joie de vivre. We collectively just miss the fire in our bellies to tell them and to share them. While Paul and the Society's long-held wish to see a Scottish broadcasting service funded by license payers has to some degree materialized, it has to be accepted that while fairly good on radio, BBC for Scotland's resources produce somewhat token television. A major frustration shared by many is the now 35 year and counting wait for the National Theatre of Scotland to deliver what would only be the third production in living memory, for some of us, of the three estates. How our language, culture, and strangely uncertain theatre could do with it. Taking this a bit further, the current paucity of work and vision over all scales at NTS, not to mention its resistance to the revival of important Scottish plays in the canon, is, I sense, the sort of cudgel that with a wry smile and a discreet nod, Paul might expect the saltire, and perhaps me, to take up. The Saltire Society was formed to take a permanent grip on the arts in Scotland. And inevitably, that grip has from time to time loosened. We owe it to Paul to tighten up. And at a time when Creative Scotland is finding it difficult to be creative, we should be leading on the re-emergence of both its spirit and its grit, championing the arts of Scotland. The bricks on Paul's hod are as firm as they were when they were fired. Inspired by his pivotal involvement in the Saltire Society's literary awards, his drive to the republication of important Scottish books, the Mackars Courts, the saving from closure of the National Portrait Gallery, the conferences that led to ADCAS, that agitator with a diversity of aims, and performances various during the festivals. It's simply, okay, 
not that simply, behoves on us to build upon Paul's solid foundations on firm ground. Paul, you were at the heart of Scotland and its ways for nearly 100 years. How we owe it to you. This is the penultimate. We're almost there. So, 1978-79, uh, that was the, the watershed in my young adult life, complete uh, change of direction. And one of the voices that are so clear in my memory from that time, with its clarity, its objectivity, uh, was Paul. Um, later, I, I was I privileged to, to get to know him and be involved in a lot of the, the projects and networks that he was involved in. And I just really wanted to add one thing that I, I think was kind of unspoken, but behind so many of the contributions, particularly maybe the one from Aaron, was how unfailingly kind, supportive, encouraging and generous Paul Scott always was in all these activities and contexts. And I can only remember actually one occasion in many discussions where I remember him being uh, caught short of words. And uh, I'll just describe this because I think it's really an illustration of his generosity and objectivity. So on one occasion he was describing to me very uh, uh, fully and uh, to my great enthusiasm his project for the concise cultural companion to Scotland, uh, which I think is a real actual Paul uh, achievement that uh, hasn't earned a mention so far. And he was describing this to me and I was enthusing about it. And then just in all innocence, I said to him and I said, Paul, um, who, who's dealing with the culture and religion angle in it? And he absolutely came to halt. And he looked at me and I said, well, it's about the role of religion, culture is quite important. And anyway, we had to move on to something else. Well, the next morning, he was on the phone to me at work. He said, Donald, I've been thinking about what you said yesterday. You know, you're right. We should have that theme. Will you write the article? There's four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, there was always an openness of uh, discussion, of collaboration, and it didn't matter who you were, who you were coming from. He wanted you to be part of that conversation. So, I would like, uh, in tribute to Paul and to Laura, I would like to uh, read uh, <coughs> a short passage from Lorimer's uh, Scott's translation of the New Testament. And some of you will recognize the words in here, the words that are uh, carved at the public, the members' entrance to the Scottish Parliament. Can I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but hey, live in my heart, I am neen better nor dunnering brass or a ringing symbol. Can I hear the gift of prophecy? And I'm acquaint with the sacred mind of God, and can all a thing ever at man may ken. And can I hae sicken faith as can flit the hills frae their larics? Can I hae all that, but hae they live in my heart, I'm not. Can I scale all my gids and graith and alms, and can I gee up my body to be burnt and ash? Can I even do that? But hey, nay, live in my heart, I'm name the better of it. Love is patient, fool. Love is couthy and kind. Name jealous. Name sprosy. Name boudant with pride. Name mislaired. Name him drocket. Name toosty. Love keeps name nick stick o' the rangs it trees. Finds nae pleasure in the ill wark o' others, is I lifted up when truth dings lees. Kens I to keep a calm sook, is I swear to misdoot, I hopes the best, I bides the worst. 
Louvre will ne'er fail. In my barren days, I had the speech of a bairn, the mind of a bairn, the thoughts of a bairn. But now that I am growing man muckle, I am through with laughing bairnly. Now we are like looking in a mirror and seeing laughing a throb. But then we look laughing braid in the face. Now I can all thing Hofflin's ways, but then I will ken all thing as weel as God kens me. In small, there is three things bides for I, faith, hope, love, but the greatest of the three is love. My name is Alan Taylor. Um, unlike Julie, uh, I remember uh, exactly when I met Paul and Laura, actually. Um, the occasion was the launch of Alistair Gray's novel, Lanark, in 1981, at what was then called the Third Eye Centre in Glasgow. It was a remarkable occasion and has become an even more remarkable occasion in, in hindsight. Um, Paul says in his autobiography that just as Alistair was about to be announced, he disappeared. Um, that was true, and I caught him out the side of my eye. He was at the far end of a room, and bizarrely, he'd taken his shoes off, or what passed for shoes, and was being given a new pair of shoes by none other than Billy Connolly. The shoes were platform sold. Uh, and the whole attention of the crowd looked round to see the author being given a shoe fit. And I had the temerity to ask Billy where he got the shoes, and he says, easy fits. That was before there was easy jet, easy everything. Easy fits was a very cheap shoes off. Anyway, um, I remember at that occasion uh, going over to talk to Paul and Lauren, because I had never met them before. And they said that they had come from Italy. And I remember my reply. Why? What on earth were you doing in Scotland when you could be in Italy? Well, that was the first of many encounters uh, with Paul. The next significant one was the following year, 1982, which is when Tessa Ransford decided that there had to be a poetry library for Scotland. At that time, I worked in the reference library on George IV Bridge and edited a magazine for librarians and uh, Tessa sent me an article outlining her idea for a poetry library uh, and that was the germ of the whole thing and of course in the time world fashion what do you do next you form a committee committees have been the bane of my life I try to avoid them and occasionally like the mafia you get sucked in you know you keep being sucked in and then you can't leave them but that committee was quite an amazing bunch of people. Uh, there was uh, Joy, I think, was on the early committee of it. There was Tom Fenton, who was a very notable publisher at the time. He published for, had a press called the Salamander Press, uh, which had been shortlisted for the Booker Prize, believe it or not. Alas, as they say hereabouts, Tom ran off with a woman in a red jumpsuit and was never seen again. Um, but the other significant person I'm sorry if Tom Fenton's in the audience. That's the truth. Um, the other significant person uh, was Paul. And Paul and Tessa were sort of yin and yang. They were not kind of compatible human beings. Paul was a, a rationalist, a diplomat, who chose his words carefully, who sort of moved almost glacier-like, in the sense that, you know, he was always going forward. You couldn't stop him. It was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Tessa was unbelievably passionate and sort of highly strung. We would go into meetings with the then blessed Scottish Arts Council, not Creative Scotland, as it is now, although I now call Creative Scotland, Creative Scotland. Um, 
But we would go into meetings with the Arts Council and the wonderful Walter Cairns, who was the literature director, and Paul would try to school us in what to say and how to tactically run this whole thing. That went out all the window, like Eddie Jones's tactics for England against the South Africans, uh, because Tessa would just burst into tears, because she thought that was the best way to persuade the Arts Council to get money. And lo, it happened. <laughs> There were some fantastic nights there. Um, the best ever, really, was um, when we decided we had to advertise for a professional librarian. Uh, the job eventually went to the wonderful Tom Hubbard. But I remember conducting or trying to chair these interviews uh, with, among others, Angus Calder, Paul and Tessa as part of a panel. And people would come in and we would interview them about why did they want to be the librarian for the Scottish Poetry Library, and this would involve late hours, I think one of our panel, male members of our panel asked, how would your husband feel about you being out at 8 o'clock at night, was the question. <laughs> I remember that caused one hell of a fuss from Tessa. The other occasions when I met Paul many, many times was these uh, Saltar Society Scottish Book Awards. I mean... <laughs> You can understand why Brexit hasn't come to pass if you've ever been at one of those meetings. Um, because you never quite knew if the Gales were fighting for a Gale or against a Gale. So if a Gale was on a shortlist and a Gale was on the panel selecting the prize, you're never sure if that Gale was going to be for the Gale who was a contender or not. And Paul was trying his best to sort of steer his way wonderfully through these kind of rather stormy waters. Then when I moved to the Scotsman, of course, I was bombarded, bombarded with articles and letters from Paul. The Scotsman, by the way, was still wonderful in those days. Um, the Scotsman has always been more wonderful than it is at the moment. Um, and so he would even be at the door offering articles and letters and, and, and whatnot. But he came brilliantly to the fore. Um, I can't remember the year now. I think it was, must have been into the late 19, into 1994. Um, I think John alluded to this, when uh, Paul decided that he would try and stop this move of the National Portrait Gallery from Edinburgh to Glasgow. This was a terrible idea, of course, you know, this, this giving up of this great Edinburgh institution. And Paul organised a debate, which was to be in somewhere like um, um, one of the smaller halls at the university, but so many people wanted to go that a thousand people turned up to debate this at the Edinburgh Art School. And this was that horrible force, the Edinburgh bourgeoisie on the march. Um, Tim Clifford sat up there trying to defend this, and the poor man was nearly strung up like Mussolini in the Second World War. And at that point, you knew, you knew that this never could happen. And this was Paul's doing. It wasn't he just actually achieved things. It wasn't that he just started things. It wasn't that he was a motivator and the kind of guy who through sheer persistence made things happen. He could also stop things happening. And sometimes, some things need to be stopped. Anyway, I'll conclude now because it is uh, getting late and I dare say you all want a drink. But something Paul himself wrote about Tessa Ransford uh, always struck me as opposite of himself, although physically they were not like. He said of Tessa, she may look like a slight and gentle woman, but she has the will to defy all obstacles. That was Paul. Thank you very much.
Arts. And I was delighted to be part of that. One of the significant achievements I remember uh, that I'd cut, there was a round about the time Hans Keller, uh, a Viennese viola player, an admirer of the works of Benjamin Britten, conspired with BBC London to try and guillotine the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra. And uh, we got up, along with many, many other organizations, of course, uh, to uh, defeat this particular scurrilous endeavor. The BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra have done more for Scottish art music uh, than almost any other organization, with the exception of Scottish Opera and the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, of course. Uh, but, so I was very, very happy to be legal uh, in this uh, conspiracy to defeat uh, and it was very much <laughs> with Paul and of course we were successful and the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra goes on to this very day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope not to detain you because as the previous uh, speaker said, I'm sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> You'll recognize this, of course. Thank you. 
My name is Morag Oops. Almost the late Morag McCormick. <laughs> uh, I'm a friend of, of Paul and Laura, and uh, I was asked to give the vote of thanks. And just how can you just say, well, thanks very much for such a special afternoon. I think we've all been privileged to be here. And I think in the years to come, we'll still be talking about this afternoon. Do you remember what so-and-so said at Paul Scott's memorial? And who knows what may come of this? It might be beginnings rather than an end of something. So I'd like to thank very much all the wonderful contributors. We have been so lucky to have all these people here in, in the one room at the one time. It's been marvelous. The music which has bookended this, or will bookend this event so well, for many thanks indeed. The new club is such an ideal place to hold this event. Paul was practically, Paul and Laura were practically fixtures at the, the window overlooking the castle. The, the club will never be the same without it. So thanks to them for the premises and for the goodies that are to come, I believe. The photographer has worked assiduously throughout this performance. The photographs, I'm told, can be seen on Lee Live Photographer this evening. Possibly they will be seen in the Edinburgh Life, we're not sure. So watch your newsstands in the future. But the biggest thanks of all, obviously, must go to Laura. She devoted herself to Paul in these, especially in these last few difficult years. I admire her so much. As a nurse, I know what's what there. And she's almost single-handedly put together this amazing event. She has been magnificent. So for the contributors, the music, the food to come, the photography, but especially for Laura, I ask you to give her three cheers, actually. Not just a clap, three cheers for all of them. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! Now a special loud one for Laura! For Laura! understand to the violin not to me <laughs> okay so this is a, a rather well-known piece with incredibly burnsy associations it's the Lee Ring and it's from the Gillespie manuscript of 1768 and I come it comes from a collection called Scots on the Fiddle by Dr. David Johnson, who was a very, very well-known Edinburgh eccentric musicologist, composer, and cellist. I'm sure Paul must have run into David at some stage in his career, and only David would come up with a title like Scots on the Fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, disregard to English Scots. <laughs> so this is the lead rate uh, in with variations from the Gillespie manuscript of 1768 on scored on a future violence.